All right, buddy. So what's your name and where are you from? My name's Cameron. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I moved to South Carolina, Charleston, when I was about nine years old. Okay. And uh, you came at me with this story because you've seen, well, I don't know. Were you watching my, my uh, channel a little bit before the whole uh, Leavenworth cat came on? I think I've been watching your channel since you've had about maybe 60,000 views. I've been watching your channel for a while. Okay, okay. So you've been here for a minute, but you just so happened to reach out to me because you've seen the guy that talked about Leavenworth, the CO guy that worked at uh, right. Guantanamo and all those places. And you were in the military, right? There. Okay, what kind of military were you in, my friend? I was in the Army army and how long were you in i was in three years after high school and two of those years that i was in was spent in leavenworth two of those years were spent in leavenworth okay man let's break it down all right uh how'd you end up in leavenworth um well i was a truck driver for the army it's uh, called an 88 mike um they have this school it's like seven weeks in missouri fort leonard wood i was in job school in 2011, right after basic training, I was about five, uh, two weeks from going home. We were doing a convoy operation. It's where they teach you how to drive the trucks the way you would in like Iraq or something. It was like 10 trucks in the convoy. I was like truck number four. I fell asleep while driving. I was supposed to have an instructor in my vehicle. They didn't put one in my vehicle. I fell asleep while I was driving. The guy in the truck beside me also fell asleep. So we had two sleeping drivers operating the vehicle. And we went off at the, the same time at the same time bro what are the odds of that it was crazy it was a crazy day but um we ended up i fell asleep while i was driving he fell asleep so he couldn't keep me up and i went off the road there was a little car that happened to just be coming at that time and there was an accident and the driver ended up dying and where was this at this was on post on fort leavenworth oh so you this was on Leavenworth. It was on base, yep. That's crazy. And then you're going to end up doing two years as an inmate in Leavenworth. I was 17 years old, man. It's my first time ever being away from home. That's unbelievable, man. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? I bet you were looking at cats at that uh, place like, damn, I'm glad I'm not, you know, I'm not where they're at, you know? And then, boom, you're living there for two years. It's crazy because I joined the military to get away from prison. I felt like I was going to go if I didn't do something with my life at that age and join the Army trying to be better and send my ass right on. So what they give you, some kind of negligence charge or something? Yeah, um, they charged me with negligent homicide. Wait, did you, did you do it to a civilian? Was it a civilian on base or what? All right, so the lady that was driving that car that I got in an accident with, she was a civilian. But her husband was like a full bird colonel for one of the little people on base. He was part of some division on base, but he was somebody important. So it kind of didn't go over well at all. Someone had to pay something. Yeah. Yeah. So you got, so what was the uh, charges? Negligent homicide, reckless endangerment, and failure to obey a lawful regulation. They do drug tests and all that, make sure you oh, were yeah. drunk or anything? They do a blood test on the spot. Yeah. Like, they pulled me out the truck, immediately took me to the ambulance, blood test, right there. And how long were you up before you passed out, man? Man. I mean, was it like rough training where you were up 24 hours or what? Well, the motto in the Army is suck it up and drive on. That's the unofficial motto. So anything you're going through, their mindset is you have to push through it to accomplish the mission so that day before they put me in the truck i had already been sleeping on on the pad they have it it's called a training pad i'd slept the whole morning that whole day was just it was it was downhill from the morning what'd you party the night before bro nah man <laughs> see the thing is when you're in the army and you're in job school you're under what's known as a training status so when you're in the training status you, you can't, can't leave. go to the bar, you can't leave base, you can't do any of the fun stuff. So none of that drinking, no smoking, nothing. You're not if you get caught, it's what So they you call were just office. straight up tired. Just straight tired, man. I've been sleeping up the whole day. Like um in the army they wake you up at four forty five and then you go do what's called PT. You do PT for about an hour, 
you get back to your your barracks about six o'clock, six thirty, go to chow, seven o'clock, you're getting ready to go start your day. And uh that particular day, woke up just no- like normal, four forty five, did PT, went to chow, came back. About seven o'clock we got ready to go to the pad to train. Our uh bus that was supposed to come pick us up, they call it a motor move. Our motor move was like two and a half hours late. So we didn't even get to the training pad until about 11 o'clock. When the army about 11 o'clock, 11.30, you're doing lunch. So we went from the training, when we got to the training pad, we instantly started eating lunch and stuff. And then they got to give you a break for an hour to digest the food before you go back to training. So I didn't do anything all morning, didn't do anything all afternoon. And then about an hour before we're supposed to go back to the barracks to go home and go to sleep, they're like, hey, let's get everybody in the trucks. You know what I mean? And yeah. I was passed out, so I missed the first couple rotations. And then they came and got me and was like, hey, man, you need some hours. You got to drive. And I was like, dang, I'm tired, bro. Like, I've been sleeping all day. I don't want to drive. They made me do it. You got to suck it up and drive on. Yeah, it's crazy. You can't really tell someone in the Army, look, man, I'm just a little tired, you know, man. Uh, you know, and that's like with any job. It's not just military. I mean, you can't just roll up on a boss, but look, man. I'm a little tired, man. I don't think I could drive the truck. They're going to look at you like, man, you know, so either way you had to do it, you know, um, it's a sad thing. And a lot of people say, how the hell can someone fall asleep at the wheel? Look, I used to be one of those cats and then I fell asleep at the wheel. I couldn't believe it, bro. I was five minutes from my house. Okay. I drove probably 45 minutes in traffic from this city called Newport News to my home. I got family up there. Yeah, I was working. I was driving from Newport News back to Chesapeake every day. And it was perfectly fine. This one day, I was working too hard, bro. Drove back home. Five minutes before I was about to pull in the driveway, I drove off the interstate into a ditch, man. Fell asleep at the wheel. Couldn't believe it. But yeah, I understand exactly how someone could fall asleep at the wheel. You just don't think it will happen to you, and then boom, it does. You know, and it's very... Whenever I take trips over uh, out of state, Brittany can tell. You know, my wife, she can tell when I'm about to pass out. You know, right. uh, but I, I can't tell it, you know, next thing you know, I'm gone. Right, so. Yeah. It seems like you're in there and the next thing you know, you're passed out. Yeah. It's weird, man. It's weird. But, uh, yeah, you just had a good meal, you know, lunch, you relax and you, you passed out a little bit. You're in the lazy mode. So I understand, but that's crazy. You ended up RIP to the individual that lost her life. It's sad, man. Sad, sad story. But you did two years off of it. Tell me how this was, man. Was it? somewhat close to what the correctional officer that I had from Leavenworth was saying? You said that there was one little thing that might have been off a little bit. Well, this is the biggest difference. So the facility that he was talking about in his interview is called the United States Disciplinary Barracks. Yeah. The DB for short. That's the castle. That's the um, that's the building that they're talking about when they say it shares a county line or it shares a property line with the USP. Yeah, that's the building they're actually talking about. The facility. All these buildings are right there next to each other. They're literally like you can. If you're in the yard, you can look across and see them. Yeah, you know what I mean. They're they're both that close. But um, the facility that he spoke about when he said they just opened a new one in 2010, where it was five and less. You go here, five years in a day. You go to the DB. I was in that facility he was talking about. The new one they had just built. And how was that, man? Um, it was, it had its moments, like, like he said, you know, because we're all military, we have that underlying respect for each other, everybody, because we were all in the army at one point, or we were all in some branch of service at one point. So there's that. But then there's the underlying racial tension, too, because just like he said, it's split up by race, you had the whites, you had the blacks, you had the others, etc. So that's how it was ran. So you had that division there. My facility at first, that first year I was there, it was five years and less. You come here. So everybody had a release date. So when something happened, you didn't really have to worry about it going to the extent of, oh, this guy's going to get stuck or he's going to get poked up or nothing like that. No, but somebody might come in your room with a lock and split your face open. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because in there, the way it's set up, it's all about your good time. You don't really get... Uh, extra charge and more time for hurting somebody to that extent. You know what I mean? They'll yeah. just take the good time away. So 
let's say if I was to run a year cell and you were there with me and I hit you with a lock, I might only lose 30 days of good time, yeah. which would probably extend my sentence like another two months. And then I'd have to do like two months in the hole and I'll be right back on the compound. Yeah, so no really, no street charges are being pressed over yeah. stuff like that. So when people have that in mind, they're not really thinking, oh, I'm about to go home in two weeks. If you run your mouth the right way to the right person, they're going to run in your room and they're going to sit that extra 30 days. You yeah, know what I mean? they're willing to take the little extra 30 days. Right. Yeah. So it used to pop off, but it wasn't ever on like a super huge scale. Yeah. Like that. it was always on an individual basis. And that's where all the crazy stuff would happen. And what do you what do you think it was? Was it individual basis, as in race wise? Well, let me ask you this, man. Before we get into the this whole thing, because this is going to tie into it, let me ask you this. Okay. Uh, you hang out with a lot of white dudes on the street. Yeah. Okay. You look you look like someone that uh, I know from out here in the streets. I told you before. You actually look like a famous comedian too, man. What was his name again? Donald Glover. Donald Glover. I didn't even know his name, but I knew who you were talking about just by the look of you, man. Uh, <laughs> But, yeah, you chill with white dudes on the street. Uh, how was it for you going into a prison and chilling with these you know, white guys in the military and stuff like that, kicking it? How was it, how much of a, like, shell shocker was it going into prison and seeing it separated like that? Um, well, to me, I wasn't really surprised because at the time I was 17, so I was the youngest dude on the compound. And in all my pretrial months leading up to my court case, you know, I'd been watching a bunch of like prison movies and documentaries. So I had this crazy impression of prison because I'd never been, you know yeah. what I mean? So I went into it with the mindset that this is prison. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. When this happens, this is how you have to handle it. So I had a, uh, my mentality was already messed up when I went in there. So it didn't really shock me to see how it was set up because I expected it to be like that from all the movies and stuff that I'd seen. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, okay, so now this it's segregated. Now, what if a black, a black guy and a white guy get to fight, man? What would have happened in, in that situation in a military prison? At my facility, it would have went down. Not like a race riot would have popped off, but we would have let them two get down. Oh, so y'all do let stuff like go shoot the one-on-one? -on -one. Yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> Or at least when I was there, because it changed. That's what I was getting ready to get into. But it changed. When I was there, it wasn't that bad. Like, we would let other races get into it. You know what I mean? But then it changed. My second year, right before I left, they had a – the DB was getting overcrowded. They were at, like, 60% capacity. So they were having a lot of stuff popping off. They kept getting locked down. So what they did is they wrote a new regulation, and they changed my facility – to 10 years unless you come come to where we were at and okay. 10 years in a day you go across the street and what they did is they took all the guys that were in level one at the db which is what dub was talking about they took all those level one guys and they brought them over to my facility because they were trying to clear out their hole because they just had people in there for so long and there were stuff just kept happening so they took all those guys from their facility over to my facility, and they were a little bit more hardcore, so things started to change real fast. Yeah, they're doing 10-piece instead of a 5-piece, so. Right. We started getting guys with 6 years, 7 years, 8 years, 10 years. Yeah, and shit changed up a little bit, huh? They started bringing a little more politics and stuff. Yeah, and it was all bad for my facility because the way we were looking at it as when those guys come over here, they're thinking they're going to come run our house. We're not yeah. going for it. Yeah. So we were ready to pop it off just because of that, because we felt like if they came over here thinking that they were over there doing all that type of time and they're going to come over here and just run stuff, we ain't going for it. Yeah. Were, was there, uh, did you end up running with anyone in there uh, other than just your own kind or what? I mean, I had my own affiliations on the street, you know, and it just kind of just got a little bit deeper in there. Like It's just like Dub said, there's people from all over in there, so... You might have some people in there that might be connected to some things, but you never really believe anybody on what they say. You got to make them prove it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anybody can say what they want. Uh, that's crazy to think, though. Uh, there's people that are affiliated with gangs and they will be for life, but they join the military at the same time. Isn't that? It is. One How does that I'm sit with the OG? <laughs> Honestly, at least with the cats I met from like Chicago, 
from what I gather, all of their OGs were the one that sent them to the military because they were supposed to go to the army, learn whatever they were learning, and bring it back to Chicago. Damn. At least the guys from Chicago that I met, that's what they were there for. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Uh so what was some of the wildest oh oh before we get into the wildest moment you had in prison? What's the situation with all these uh, chomos in there, man? Is there a lot of them, like you were saying? That's the one. That's the biggest thing I wanted to speak on. All right. So at my facility, it was five years and less the first year, and then ten years and less the second year. So Dub was right. Sixty percent of the people in the DB and my facility called the RCF. They are there for sexual assault. Sixty percent of them, but that doesn't make all of them chomos. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably about 20 or 30 percent of that 60 percent with Tromo. So they okay. don't have the numbers, at least at my facility, like he made it seem. And they have absolutely no pool at all. None whatsoever. None at all. And y'all but y'all were at different facilities, correct? Right. OK. And you were in what's the RCF. exact name of the facility you were in? It's the RCF Regional Correctional Facility. OK. OK. But there still is a lot of sexual uh, people with sexual charges in there. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. And do they get attacked in any way, shape, or form, or what? Are they let, they're allowed to ride the yard, or what? Not that they're allowed to ride the yard. So, like, how it's set up, it's not like normal blocks. They're modular housing units. So it's like a big rectangle, and it's got levels. And, yeah. then, you know, they got the tables and stuff like that. So the way we ran it is... There's six phones in the back. The three phones on the right, those are the black phones. The three phones on the far left, that's everybody else's phone. And then there's two tables in the back. Those are the black tables. There's two tables in the middle. Those are the others. There's two tables in the front. Those are the whites. And there's one tiny table that only has three chairs. And that's where all the child molesters have to be at. They're not allowed to walk the housing unit. They're not allowed to touch the remote for the TV. They don't get a vote when it's movie night. None of that. Yeah. They're like ostracized. We don't necessarily run them off the compound, but we don't. They're not allowed them. To be dealt with at all. Yeah, I believe it. Um, well, tell me, did you get a dishonorable discharge, man? Actually, that's the crazy part of my whole story. Is I actually didn't get a discharge at my court martial, so I was returned to duty. So I did my 22 months and two days out of my 28 month sentence, and I went back to the army and I went back to duty. That's so damn crazy, man. Yeah, man. And, I mean, did they put you right back into another damn truck training course or what? <laughs> no. Um, what happened is when I got out, the military has this, like, uh, it's almost like a halfway house. But it's a military unit. It's so crazy. Yeah. But, um, they, they assigned me there, so I went there. It's in Oklahoma and Fort Sill, where the old facility used to be. And, um... They, when I got there, they asked me, they said, hey, you can fight to stay in the Army, but if you try to fight and stay, then I have to recommend you for other than honorable discharge, which basically means if they don't let me stay in, then I'll get a other than honorable discharge, right? So you but took it, a plea bargain. Right. But he was like, if you don't want to stay in and you just want to leave, then I'll recommend you for a general under honorable conditions. And I had a couple days to think about it, and I was like, man, do I really want to go back to the army, you know, and work yeah. for them? They just threw me aside after that situation and totally threw me under the bus, drug my name through the mud. And I was like, I can't really be a part of this organization anymore. So I left. I told him, give me that general under honorable conditions. I'm going home, buddy. Yeah. Uh, I probably would have too, man. Um, I mean, with a plea like that, you know, uh, do you think, do you feel a little salty about how everything went down, man? I do, man, because I was 17 years old, and I, I think about that accident every day. You know, I, I still don't sleep. I had one good night of sleep. It was four months after I started my sentence, and uh, I was on trazodone. They had just prescribed me trazodone sleeping pills. and I'm Things like, are powerful, bro, dude. Bro, they were... In the military, they give them out like it's candy, high oh, yeah. everything, man. I was taking like 800 milligram Seroquils in there. I was getting 150 milligram trash. Oh, was this in prison or out of prison? In prison. Yeah, in prison. Prison. prison's all that I've been in. They give the same stuff, and I'll tell you what, this shit makes men 
zombies, ladies and gentlemen. Oh man, that that's Walking part of zombies. one of the crazy stories I got because I seen people go nuts off of those pills, man. For real, like it's crazy. But yeah. um, I was off of those trazodones. I just got them. I was so hyped because everybody told me, you know, take them and fight them and you'll get high and shit. And I was in the hole. So I was like, oh, I bet. And um, because I had gotten a fight. So I was in the hole for like three months. And um, it was like right after I got to GP. I was only in GP for nine days before I went to the hole for four months, basically. But um, while I was in the hole, got those pills, went, took them, was listening to Mandatory Metallica on the uh, Bubba the Love Sponge. <laughs> 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 Yeah. yeah. 12 o'clock at night, I passed out on him. And the only thing I remember is I feel like as soon as my head hit the pillow, I woke up and I was right back in the accident, dude. And I was just, you know, going through it. And then I just heard the accident happen. It was just like a loud bang, boom. And I just woke up instantly. And I looked at myself. I was pouring sweat. And I haven't slept a good night ever since, dude. That's for real. Sad man, were you knocked unconscious during the uh, accident or anything? Um, no, I I was already uh, unconscious because I fell asleep. So when the accident happened, it actually woke me up. Like it was like I'm not to describe it. So but, you were able to get out and see if everyone was okay. Well, I never even got the opportunity to see if they were okay because as soon as I came out the truck. There was literally an instructor like right there about to open the door. So as soon as I hopped out, he just grabbed me and took me to the other side of the street. Me and the other guy that was in the truck. So we couldn't even see what was well, going on. that's best then probably, you know? Yeah. I mean, I asked about the lady. You know, I was like, is everybody okay? I asked, but. I bet you were terrified when you found out she lost her life. I didn't even find out that she lost her life until about a week later. The worst part about the whole ordeal was right after the accident happened. After the accident, they put me in what's known as a holdover status, which means I wasn't training anymore, but I wasn't going home. You know what I mean? So I had to get two assigned escorts. They called on my battle buddies. So I had two people with me everywhere I went for like the next. That happened in October. I didn't get sentenced until May. So from October to May, I had two people with me everywhere I went everywhere what do you mean like like uh just to make sure you don't leave yeah kind of i mean did they go in your crib and everything or what well the i was, I was whatever? living in the barracks yeah because i was like 18 17 18 at the time so i was living in the barracks you and they I mean? just stayed next to your bed well they were assigned to be my roommates they were you know so we had to do everything together wake up go to chow together come back to chow any details that they wanted us to do around post we did that together um, any and everything you could think of, I had to do it with those two people. The same two people. Same two people. My boy, I bet you got to know them, huh? Movie. Oh yeah, those are good dudes, man. One of the guys was from Oregon. The other one was from Kokomo, Indiana. My boy Halupa. Shout out Halupa. What's up, Halupa? Yeah, man, he's a good dude. <laughs> they were good dudes, man. But um, they helped me out a lot, man, because that was a really depressing time for me because I had never been through anything like that before, and I was so young, man, and um. Yeah, they kept me, they kept me stable, kept me from doing some crazy stuff, man. But at least they didn't railroad you, man. Two years yeah. is a decent amount of time, not too much, not not right. too little. I was or, facing 17 years off of that accident, yeah, man. Yeah, I know a few people that had the same exact charges, and they've gotten about 15 years, you know. So oh. you got blessed, man, even years, though it went man. through a shitty situation, and you might be salty about it, but you got to learn you know, and and – Take what you can from it. Look, right. realize the positivity out of it. Look, it could have been a lot worse. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah man. Okay. Let me ask you two more questions before we end this, man. First, what was your most entertaining moment about the army training in the army? Was there anything that you just felt like was just damn? This was fun. Oh yeah, yeah, man. So when I was in basic training, right. We have this thing, it's called Basic Army Rifle Marksmanship, BRM uh -huh. for short. And um, that's when you get to like shoot your gun for the first time, you get to shoot at pop-up targets. Mm -hmm. you get to shoot, uh, it's called an M203, it's like an M16 with a grenade launcher on it. You get to shoot an AT4, which is like a rocket launcher. 
Yeah. Put you the 50 cal, like the real. Ooh, cow. how was that 50 cal, bro? Oh, man, it's fun. It's all fun. You shoot everything that the Army gives you in like a regular squad, and it was so much fun. That was probably one of the funnest times in the Army. You ever shot a uh, 50 cal sniper? Nah, nah, I didn't get to shoot that. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome though, man. You know, I'm really intrigued about the military. You know, I know it has its pros and cons. Uh, mm-hmm. Something I don't really like about it is someone telling me what to do every damn day. But at the same time, you get to shoot guns and stuff, man. You know, yeah, damn. You get to do a whole bunch of fun stuff. The gas imagine- training is pretty fun too. Jesus, I can't even imagine shooting off a damn rocket. <laughs> it's intense. It's intense, but, uh, man. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Now, uh, last and Last but not least, one of the most important questions I ask everyone, man. Uh, what was one of the wildest moments you had in prison or wildest things you might have seen? Um, the wildest thing I ever saw, there's this little dude from Ohio, my boy Hill. He was like five foot, built like a, you know what I mean? Just stocky little short dude with glasses. Yeah. And um, he'd been down for a while. He was, he was at the Fort Sill facility. So he was kind of like, already crazy and um, everybody knew like and he was new to our house but everybody knew whose tv it was who runs the remote you know what i mean it's our tv so we were playing dominoes they came and asked us hey can we use your tv we were like yeah we let them use the tv and um we're playing bones or whatever we get done the movie's about to come on it's like seven o'clock so we're like okay we got the movie on this is something we do every weekend. Yeah, every movie weekend. night. Yeah. And um, same routine. Play Bones, then we watch the movie. You know what I mean? Same routine. Or we might play Spades or something. But it's the same routine. And um, 7 o'clock, we go over there to switch the TV like normal. Boom, switch that TV. And Hill got mad, man. He got mad because he wanted to watch that show that we were watching or they were watching while we were playing Bones. He got mad. And uh, my boy Will from Tulsa, my boy Will, black, he uh, he's he's the one that stepped up and was like, "Hey man, look, you know the routine, yada yada yada." Well, when he said that, man, Hill just hopped up, bro, and just started swinging, just started nailing him. And this is the craziest thing I saw because it it got a lot of respect for me. My boy Will, he's like six foot, you know, one ninety. We both work out every day, you know what I mean. Hill's one of those guys that stays in the pod. He don't work out every day, like. He could have really destroyed this dude, but he didn't throw a single punch. He actually put his hands behind him and ate every punch like a soldier. You know Who, what the, I mean? uh, your homeboy? Yeah, my homeboy, Will. My boy, Black. Yeah, man, he sat there and he just let he just took the little hits because he understood something that it took me years to learn. It's like not everybody is worth that. You know what I mean? He had like four kids. He's already facing time when he left the facility because a lot of dudes will come in and they'll get military charges and leave and got to go face state charges wherever they live. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he was one of those types of people, and he didn't want to do anything too much. So he just put his hands behind his back and took it. And that was the craziest thing I ever saw because it took a lot of respect. Well, that's what's up, man. Do you have anything you would like to say to anyone out there that might be going to the military penitentiary, man? Any kind of advice, anything that you could give someone? Um. Well... It's definitely gotten a little bit different since I was last there. I, I finished my sentence in 2014, and I know that pretty much everybody there now has at least 10 years, and they're going to do about 90% of that 10 years. So my advice would be, if you don't got no time like that, sit in your cell, you know, do your time. Don't let your time do you. Read some books, work out, do something productive. Don't get involved in the politics. You won't go home. Yeah, and you can – Definitely uh, do your time pretty much a lone wolf in military prison, correct? To a certain extent, yeah. Yeah. As long as you don't have, like, a big mouth. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate you coming on here telling me your story. It was a wild one, man. It was a wild one. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me coming, and, man. Hey, man. Uh, I appreciate you watching my content for so long. It's amazing. It's amazing the people I get to meet on this channel, man. Uh, do you have any kind of shout-outs you would like to say before you leave or what? Um, yeah, man, uh, I just wanted to say shout out to my boy Anderson from Oregon, one of my battle buddies, shout out Halupa from Kokomo, my boy Black from Tulsa, shout out to all of y'all, man, hope y'all doing all right, man, God bless. 
That's what's up, man. And you keep doing what you're doing out there, man, enjoying life and staying free, all right? Yes, sir. You know that. All right, buddy. You be easy out there. You too, Bubba.